right, everybody, welcome to episode six of the Integrate Live virtual workshop. I'm Jeff Nepper, and I'm joined by everybody's friend, Alan Ray. Alan, how are you, sir? Doing great, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm really good. Thank you. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody can properly hear in. And uh, as we get ready to get started, um, do me a favor, our participants, we want to make sure that we're as interactive as possible today. Um, so please use the Q&A feature inside of uh, your Zoom controls and uh, show me in the chat, if you would, if audio is coming through clearly. Easiest thing to do is just give us a thumbs up or, uh, hey, how are you? Or introduce yourself to everybody in the room, please. We'll give you a second to do that. I see Bobby's raising his hand. Thanks, Bobby. And if you could let me know, are our is our video coming across clear for everybody? You should have a screen share and you should be able to see all of our panelists. Give me a yes, everything looks good if you don't mind. Audio and video, okay. Perfect, thanks, Manuel. All right, that's what we needed because I'll be honest, everybody, we're a bit rusty. It's been, uh, we took the summer off from doing virtual workshops. We had our double live rundown edition, which was a lot of fun. I hope you got to see that. If you didn't, um, please go back and uh, take a look. But we're going to knock the rust off of it. We're going to get started. And uh, Alan, why don't you uh, introduce our guide for the day? All right. Well, it's my privilege to introduce a close personal friend of mine who has done uh, some amazing work for... Uh, for me in the past, his name is Kyle, and he works with Avidyne, and he's going to be our host today. Kyle, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Alan. Yes, um, <clears throat> I work for Avidyne. I'm a project manager over on that space, a uh, SCADA systems engineer, and I work on the full tech stack all the way from, you know, uh, connecting up PLCs uh, into, into the SCADA system, getting historian, all that fun stuff. So, <clears throat> fantastic. All right, so let's go ahead and introduce some of our uh, our main speakers today, our panelists. Uh, we have, from Opto22, we have uh, Benson, who is a fantastic gentleman, worked with him on a couple different projects. Um, we have, from Canary, we have Sean, who's a solution specialist. Uh, from HiveMQ, we have Kudzai, uh, who's a developer advocate. And from Imperio, we have Ron, um, uh, who is the CTO. And who else is snuck in that room? Uh, we've got Peter there also, right? Yeah, also Peter. Excited. Good to meet you. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, we didn't have a five uh, picture slide template. <laughs> I, I promise to not take it too personally. <laughs> Next time we can share one spot for uh, two photos. <laughs> Put you both in one picture. There you go. Yeah, there awesome. we go. A little mesh up. I made a hey, joke. Jeff, hang on. Yeah. Hey, Mike. My wife just uh, asked me if I'd seen the dog bowl. I didn't even know it bowled. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's starting early. We do have we have a lot of dad jokes to tell because we are uh, taking that break. But uh, should we save them or should we keep going? Well, I have one. Um, okay. So why are elevator jokes so good? I don't know. I don't know why. They work on so many levels. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's very good. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. That was good. I actually noticed, Kyle, that uh, based on uh, looking at your video, you've got some new glasses compared to the headshot that we had of you. Um, this is true. I also got some pretty cool glasses, 100% uh, recycled from ketchup bottles, which I thought was kind of sustainable and cool. Well, how are they working, Jeff? Uh, I can't see a thing, but my my hindsight is perfect. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey well, Jeff, I, was... I had a question for you. Yeah, yeah what you got? Yeah, well, why didn't Han Solo enjoy his steak dinner? I, I don't know. It was chewy. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's so that's wrong. so painful. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, well done, very well uh, done. Well, I was very excited for uh, today's today's webinar. In fact, it uh, struggled to get any sleep, but finally, I did fall asleep, and uh, I had a dream that I was a muffler. Unfortunately, I woke up very exhausted. So, I'm hoping <laughs> I get through this. That's good. That's good. 
Uh, should are we are we let's just, ready? Let's just finish the thing off, man. We need to go to uh Peter and uh, all right, Ron and then uh, yeah, so um, I, my mine is less, uh, mine is more a sad story because uh, today my son asked, Can I have a bookmark? and it really broke my heart because after 11 years, he still doesn't know my name is Peter. <laughs> I will go with uh, what do Kermit the Frog and uh, Henry VIII got in common? What does Kermit the Frog and Henry VIII have in common? Good same idea. Same name. Same, same middle name. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Ron. All right. We'll, uh, well, we better get going or we're going to be complaining we don't have enough time for our demo. Uh, guys, Ladies, everybody, thank you so much for joining us again with Integrate Live. As you've come to know, this was a mission that Alan and I wanted to start so that we could gather together. Um, we do it two ways. Today is our virtual workshop, which means next Wednesday is the rundown. So remember, today we're trying to help use technology and solve real world business problems that you can apply immediately to your operations. And next week, we're going to talk about it. We're going to tell stories. We're going to tell more jokes. And we're going to have some fun. So please join us next Wednesday, same time. Uh, you can do so live uh, on LinkedIn or YouTube as well. Um, so what is the cadence that we meet? As I've discussed, it's every other Wednesday. Why do we do it this way? Because we want to gather you together. And I'm really excited to announce if you go right now to integratelive.com, this is complete beta. It is early, early days, but we'd love for you to get in early with us. If you go to integratelive.com, we are opening our online community as of today. So you can create your own account on integratelive.com. You can participate in conversation. We can start to ask real-time questions of each other. Uh, most importantly to me, uh, we can also connect on secondary levels, meaning Alan and I are really into brewing coffee. Like we geek out about it every day. There's probably not a day in the year that I don't brew my own coffee. We've created a little place on the community where if you're into coffee, we can talk about that together. We can share our setups. We can discuss that. Alan, you're into woodworking. You're into mechanics. You're into being a granddad. You're into uh, supporting your, your kids who are missionaries, all awesome things that we can engage and talk about if we have that in common. So integratelive.com, it opened up today. You can create your profile and start the conversation. And that <laughs> sound means that someone just did. So thank you for that. I hope, do me a favor and interrupt the whole broadcast today with <laughs> lots of beeps just coming off of beeping. my computer. I would figure out how to turn that off, but I don't know how to. <laughs> All right. So what are we talking about uh, today? We're talking about how we can grow together. And that is following the creation of a data point and the value of that data point, Alan. And it goes the whole way from creation to obsolete, right? Yeah. Uh, with the systems and the people. And it couldn't be more important that we, we focus on the people and the value that we're driving. Absolutely. And so in our previous episodes, we've done everything from edge data collection. Uh, there, See those beeps? That just means I'm getting some love on the Integrate Live community. Thank you, everybody. Um, we focused the whole way from edge data collection, the whole way up through how we can share that information uh, into cloud resources. Uh, today, we're really excited because today, Kyle, we're going to solve a whole different business use case. Tell us about that, if you would. Of course. Um, so the business use case that we're going to be tackling today um, is going to be, <clears throat> we're going to be tackling um, that we have a number of assets that we need to monitor that would normally overwhelm any type of manual monitoring capabilities. And that can be, you know, when you're looking at your SCADA system that is just far too intense, especially if you're looking at like a high level um, a higher level view, uh, you're not going to be able to ascertain the data, the information that you need, nor are you going to be able to act on some of your, um, on some of the, the, the incorrect things that are happening in your system. You're not going to see that you're losing some data, that some of the data is flatlining. Um, you're not going to be alerted um, all the time that some, that you need to take some of the actions that would be appropriate. Um, 
And so the proposed solution to this is that we're going to leverage machine learning to monitor some of these critical processes that we're not going to be able to see. Uh, even with, you know, even if we were just staring at a trend and monitoring it, we still, as an individual, as a person, we're, we would not be able to detect some of that, uh, some of that stuff I was just talking about. Um, and also taking into consideration data quality, um, security threats, and then kind of where uh, first to look and where to act when you're looking at the system as a holistic view. Hey, can I, can I give a kind of a history of how this all came about for me? Um, I'm kind of the driving force behind this this workshop. But uh, while I was working with Air Energy and got the privilege of being on a one of the the teams that was looking at centralizing our operations and doing a bunch of that stuff, and and because I worked in the software development side and we had Canary and Ignition, and all those things, we did we were working on dashboards and. Um, and operations was rightly so giving us, hey, these are the things because we're going to lower our man count, right? That's what we're going to centralize. These are the things we need to be looking at. And what became very evident is that um, dashboards analytics are great. But when you start to think about looking at 90 different dashboards to try to validate whether or not where you need to send the people to make sure they're, they're going in the right place, and you start to think about the reality of having a human can typically handle six alerts an hour effectively. Any more than that becomes very difficult. And so how can we, how can we start to use machine learning to alert us on data quality and process health of our systems and get alerts that tell us where to go and where to look? And so that's really um, what has driven this for me. I met the Aperio guys years ago. When I saw it, I immediately got this vision of what I hoped it would become. And we are, we're going to show you a little bit of that today, but working towards really having the ability to, to have raw data from your transmitters go into a, I'm giving a little bit away here, going into machine learning engines that will literally tell you what the health and quality of your system is and give you alerts off of that. So I'm excited about today. I'm excited about this use case. And uh, I'm always excited to be with Benson, so. <laughs> there we go. All right, well, let's dig in. Kyle? Yeah, so just a quite like a small snippet of, a small summary of who we are as a company here at Avidyne is that um, kind of like as Alan said, we've worked with Alan quite a few times. We've worked with uh, quite a few different companies over the years. And we've implemented many projects across oil and gas, water management, manufacturing, agriculture, uh, retail, warehousing, and energy. And we can create custom modules to integrate uh, particular systems or even um, in, in, in cases like the Epic, we've developed an Opto22 API module to integrate uh, the hardware and, and uh, its functionality with Ignition and other, and other systems to be able to uh, communicate, control, and better integrate the systems. Um, we also do other pro services, but uh, that's kind of us in a nutshell there. Awesome. Thank you, sir. And introducing the tech stack that we're going to be talking about today for our business use case. Um, from Opto22, um, you're going to have to, these are kind of, if you think about it this way, these are the tools that you're going to need in your toolbox. Um, so you have the Groove Epic, from HiveMQ, you're going to have your MQTT broker. Uh, from Canary, you're going to have your Canary historian. And from Imperio, you're going to have your anomaly detection. And then I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Benson from Opto22. Talk about his, his part in this tech stack. Terrific. Thank you, Kyle. And <clears throat> indeed, it's been a pleasure working with you over the past uh, couple of years to develop some really cool solutions for customers uh, particularly the, the code that you wrote that addressed uh, being able to manage cybersecurity out on the edge from your Ignition dashboard, from your Ignition SCADA system. So uh, pretty exciting there. And we've got quite a few customers uh, that are using that. So very cool. So quickly about Opto, if you uh, don't know who we are, we've been around a while, as you can see there, almost five decades. Uh, we are somewhat unique in the industry where we've taken this notion of OT rugged systems like PLCs and so on, designed to work in very challenging environments. 
but also mixed it with a blend of IT technologies to really extend and uh, uh, the capabilities of this system to uh, democratize data, which is you know, essentially the, the exchange of operational data with IT systems. Uh, and uh, we do so by using you know, off-the-shelf technologies, standard protocols, and uh, several of those will come into play uh, with my demo coming up. Everything we do is made right there in that building that you see in the picture. This is Temecula, California, about an hour north of San Diego, uh, California, of course. And uh, it's where we design, manufacture, support, sell. Everything we do is, is made right there. So clearly made in the USA. And that's given us a little bit of a leg up in these challenging supply chain uh, you know, issues that we're all facing. Uh, so because we do everything, we're completely vertically integrated and we have our, you know, we manage our own supply chain. Uh, the good news, we're still shipping product. So uh, if you're having challenges getting controls gear, give us a give us a ring, see if we can help you. And with that, we'll move on to a little bit about this epic that Kyle just spoke of. Uh, it is a real time controller. So for the most part, it's a PLC, but it's really a more of a PLC on steroids. Uh, it's got a built-in web and mobile-based HMI. It's got an HDMI port, so I can go right out to a, a touchscreen monitor. It's got a, a bevy of rich software tools that we're going to talk a little bit about here coming up. Lots of different uh, software tools that are on there. It's almost like you know a, a PLC in the in the notion of a smartphone kind of came together. You got a great piece of hardware and a smartphone, and you've got all kinds of different software based on the tasks that you need to do. Uh, and that's indeed what uh, Epic's about. But you can't do that on a plant floor unless it's cyber secure. And indeed, we've put so much uh, cyber secure technology uh, into this product from you know being able to create network segmented zones, uh, which allow us to protect the OT network from, uh, from the IT network, uh, port redirection, otherwise known as conduits. That's something that Kyle uh, and I worked on uh, from an ignition perspective. There's a VPN client in there, so we can access these devices from anywhere in the world 100% securely and without opening up any ports. Uh, and speaking of ports, there's a full firewall in there, there's certificates, even user accounts. So you can't even log into this thing uh, unless you uh, do so securely and with authentication. So that takes us to um, some of the primary features. We get this question a lot, so I'll make it quick. Uh, it, this is a, it's basically a Linux computer uh, with a quad core CPU, lots of ethernet ports, Wi-Fi, USB, uh, the stainless steel chassis that you mount your IO modules on uh, comes in various sizes. So there's hundreds of IO options as you would expect from a PLC. Uh, but more is there software on there to allow you to talk to other PLCs. Uh, including Ignition Edge, which is outside of the scope of this particular presentation, but that's there. There's a lot of different ways to integrate your legacy systems. Uh, indeed, it's industrial, it's a uh, wide temperature range there, UL ATEX approved, uh, built-in color touchscreen, uh, talked about the onboard HMI, uh, but of course the biggest news is, is that it's really embedded secure web-based system management. You don't need to download software to get up and running with this guy, you do it all with your browser. Uh, and that is going to take us to my final slide, which is essentially what the architecture lo looks like. Now, don't worry about trying to take this image and embed it in your brain. I'm going to actually bring this up a little bit later. But this is the architecture that we'll actually be using through the demo. And uh, Jeff, as you start to click through, I am going to show you one. Uh, just uh, there you go. The first thing we're going to do is talk a, a little bit about the Epic and getting it configured. Uh, and then as indicated, the next thing we'll do is the broker, set up the broker. Uh, we'll also be showing connectivity with the Canary Historian. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna also talk about the Aperio getting this data, but we're gonna do this securely. We're gonna do this very in real time. And we're gonna set all this up for you uh, in, uh, in the demo portion of this. Then finally, I'm also gonna show you, this is an existing system. It's my demo system right over my shoulder here. Uh, and indeed, we do have a SCADA system set up on a cloud server that's ingesting and visualizing all this data. All of this is happening at the same time. So excited to show you guys the demo. Awesome. Thank you, Benson. Um, so with this, we're going to go ahead and move into um, the Hive section, the Hive MQ. And uh, Kudzai, if you would take it away. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. So 
Again, I'm Kutsai Mandi Teresa. I'm a developer advocate at HiveMQ. So just to give you a brief background of uh, HiveMQ. So we're a company that was founded in uh, 2012, just outside of Munich uh, in Germany. And uh, the whole basis for the company is that uh, in today's uh, hyper-connected world, we see that more and more uh, people and things are being connected and, con and communicating with each other. And so HiveMQ provides a, a messaging platform based on MQTT protocol to achieve this kind of connectivity in a very reliable, highly scalable and uh, flexible way. And uh, as you may be aware, uh, the MQTT protocol is, is already in use uh, in many IoT use cases like uh, connected assets, uh, uh, transportation, logistics, and also uh, smart manufacturing, which is uh, what our uh, demonstration is going to be about today. So yeah, I think uh, Jeff uh, went ahead and, and, and uh, moved on to the next slide. So if you see there, we've got uh, the logos for the companies that we uh, actually help to, to achieve uh, a great deal uh, by only focusing on their uh, core businesses, right? So this uh, diagram that you're looking at here shows you the different uh, uh, options of packaging or offerings that we have as HiveMQ. So you've got an option of actually hosting a HiveMQ MQTT broker on a, a public cloud, right, self-hosted. And uh, in the event that you want to host this on-prem, you could also use tools like your Kubernetes and OpenShift to actually uh, deploy HiveMQ broker on your own uh, IT premises. And uh, also we do have a HiveMQ cloud, which is a, a managed service. So this like maybe if you're working as a one man engineer or small team or even a big team, sometimes these big companies that don't want the hassle of uh, having to manage IT infrastructure, you could then use a Hive MQ Cloud, which is a managed service. And uh, this is what I'm going to be using uh, for this demonstration here today. And we do have a, 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 an ecosystem of SDKs. So to connect to enterprise applications and uh, some connectivity applications like Kafka, MongoDB, SAP, so we do have uh, extensions that connect directly to the broker and push all of that information to your enterprise uh, applications. Yeah, so that's all about it. And I'm excited to be part of this workshop today. Awesome. Thank you, Kudzai. We really appreciate that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and be in, uh, moving on to Canary's aspect and, and portion to this project. Uh, so. If um, if you wouldn't mind taking that away, Sean, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kyle. <clears throat> yeah, it's funny. Just as I was about ready to talk, I took a drink of water <clears throat> and went down the wrong pipe. So excuse me. <laughs> Nothing like doing something live. Um. Anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, what I want to talk about is um. Well, first of all, for those that don't know a lot about Canary, our claim to fame is our data historian. It's a NoSQL time series database that's very secure, it's open and it's accessible. And um, one, of the, one of the foundations of getting the data in there, historian is through our data collection process. So what you're kind of looking at here is just on the right-hand side is all these different protocols that we have drivers for. Um, but what I really wanna focus on today is how our MQTT collector, which is how we're gonna connect the Hive MQ we'll be able to bring that data into our historian. Now the MQTT collector, it supports JSON and Sparkplug B protocol. And so the, the, the great thing about our collector is that you can collect just the data you want by subscribing to specific topics. So there's a filtering process. And I'm gonna actually show you guys a little bit more of this process here when we get into our demo portion. But you can um, basically eliminate all the noise and extra data that you don't really need, and you can filter that and store all that data into our historian. And the nice thing about not only just our MQTT collector, but any of our data collectors, the data collection is always unlicensed. So you could have all kinds of sites out on the edge, and you can install Canary collectors at any of those sites at your own free will. There's no charge or any licensing involved with that. So when, when it comes time to deploy our system, you know, where, where do we want to put our historian at? So we give you a lot of flexibility. As I mentioned, we have a very adaptable solution. So you can deploy it anywhere on your architecture. 
Um, now, a lot of our customers, they, they deploy the historian on premise. Um, you know, some of our, our customers have their own cloud solution, whether that's Azure, AWS, it's easily deployed there just as simply as an on-premise uh, server. And then from the Canary side, you know, we work with a lot of folks that don't really have the IT staff necessary to manage their historian, or they just uh, really just prefer a cloud environment. And uh, we have our own managed AWS environment for that. Great thing there is it's just a software as a service. So we can spin up an AWS environment very quickly for our customers and start hosting a Canary Historian. Um, and the really cool thing is we're really excited about is in 2023, we're going to have uh, the ability to spin up a Linux you know, containerized environment using Kubernetes. Uh, so all those uh, you know systems out there that require that Linux environment, you know, we, we got you covered. It's coming. So um, part of being adaptable, as I said, our solution is, you know, we have the ability once we store the data in the historian is getting that data out into other platforms, which is going to be the point of, you know, us uh, connecting with Aperio later. Uh, how, how do we get that data out of our system? I'm going to kind of walk you through all these points later, but we have many ways to get the data out of the historian. We have an unlicensed web API and .NET API which is what we're going to focus on here a little bit later with Aperio. Um, but we also have the ability to publish directly out of our system uh, via MQTT. Um, so I'm going to be demonstrating that as well, how simple that is to start publishing data. Um, we also support ODBC. So for those uh, maybe SQL databases or, or reporting tools that require uh, data consumption in a SQL-like manner, uh, we have an ODBC uh, driver for that. And then we can very simply export data to CSV, which I'll be demonstrating right out of our client tools. Very, very simple. And uh, obviously, I'm going to show you our dashboarding and trending tool as well. Uh, so that's just a way to get that live data into, into other people's hands. Um, but yeah, looking forward to you know, showing you all this in a little bit here. It gets much more exciting, I promise. Fantastic. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on to Aperio. Uh, so if uh, Ron or Peter, if either one of you guys want to take over and talk about your yeah. part of this. Yes, thank you very much, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. So what Aperio does is data quality. And obviously, it's been established throughout this webinar so far that data is really a driving force behind modern industrial operations. And what we do is we ensure that the data is actually high quality. What we see happening often is that that data is not quality checked properly and it's either applied at random or it's not applied because of uncertainty around its quality. And that obviously has a lot of potentially detrimental effects on operations. So what we do is we provide full data quality directly from the source and that's what we will show. And ultimately that's what will allow customers to do more data-driven business and operating decisions because we have automatically validated the operational data quality at scale. So it's ready to be applied. If you jump to the next slide. So data quality, it's a big topic uh, and it's very difficult to get a handle on. And the reason for that is that high quality data needs to comprise a lot of dimensions. We've listed the six dimensions that we see as core to data quality. And that is that data must be accurate, consistent, complete, valid, integral, and timely. And this is true for all data at all time and everywhere. So obviously it's a massive task to undertake. Um, that's why it's difficult. And that's why we focus exclusively on data quality as the Aperio company. So what we do is we, across all of these metrics or parameters, we ensure, we validate the data streams in real time. And then we roll all of this insight up into easy to understand metrics like our data quality index which allows users both to dive into the details and understand if they have data quality issues, what is driving that, but also go to a higher level of aggregation and, and look across operations and say, okay, in general, how, how are we doing on the data quality topic? Uh, data quality is getting better or worse. You can see how different initiatives will impact your data quality and, and obviously act accordingly. And you can go to the next slide. And in, in terms of what this means technology stack wise, so we actually sit as an infrastructure layer between the data source, the data substrate as we call it, and the business application layer. 
So that puts a lot of requirement on us at a period because we need to connect to a lot of different data sources. But we do this because we want to be able to fit into any and all operating environments. We see customers, almost every customer has a different approach to operating environments, and we want to make sure that we fit in regardless of what it looks like. On the other side, we deliver our data quality to different business applications, and that really opens up the use case scope. So we see use cases depending on data quality, anything from AI and automation over analytics operations to compliance and reporting. We can definitely tackle all of the use cases, but we can also tackle these use cases more in a more targeted manner based on the customer's digitalization agendas, objectives, and priorities. So sometimes data quality in itself would be an, an objective. Let's just improve data quality because we know that it enables any and all work with the data. In other cases, customers will come with specific pain points saying our automated environmental reporting is really struggling because the data that we get for the reports is really not a great quality and that gives a lot of headaches towards the end of the period when we report or we've implemented analytics systems or operation monitoring systems and we're struggling getting people to trust these because we cannot show them that the data that was the foundation for the system output is actually high quality. So it's really a mishmash of data sources and, and business applications and in the middle of all that sits a period and we're trying to provide you know, data quality to all people for all things. I'll give you a quick, uh, just really quick example of when we converted from our a legacy HMI system, I won't say the system, but when we converted from a legacy HMI system, which is one of the biggest, and we went to Ignition, the biggest pain point we had was Ignition did not hide the quality of the tag where the other system did. And so all of a sudden operations, we kept getting calls from operations telling us, hey, this is garbage. The system does not work. I got all kinds of red, you know, overlays on these on these tags. I'm like, no, no, it's it's exactly what you have. It's not that the system's bad. It's that you have been masking these problems for years and now they're exposed. I'll tag on there a little bit, kind of knowing what you guys are going to be working through with machine learning. And, and I have a, not a major background in machine learning, but I have a little bit. I did a small project. Uh, I did a focus of machine learning when I was doing collegiate. Um, but data quality is where it's at. You need a lot of data. And you need it to be very high quality in order for, to really get any any powerful models out of it. So I appreciate what you guys do here. All right. And then moving on to our flow of data, kind of how we're going to be pushing the data through the system. Um, we're going to be getting it from the original source, which is going to be the data that is going to be extracted uh, into the Octo 22 Epic. Um, and then from there, we're going to be uh, publishing that data to the HiveMQ uh, Hive um, broker. And then that is going to be uh, be um, consumed by Canary and Aperio, um, and it's going to be consumed historically by Hyperio through Canary and also real time um, to Aperio through the Hive MQ. If I misspoke at any part of that, please let me know. <laughs> I'm fairly confident that's how it works out. <laughs> yeah. I think you nailed it, Kyle. All right, so Kyle, we've got our problem. How do we monitor overwhelming amount of process data? Uh, and use machine learning. Are you ready to go? I think we're ready and we're right. set and let's Good. go. <laughs> First step, Benson, we need you to connect to some data sources, please. Get that stuff up to a modern architecture for us. Okay. Let's see if I can share a screen here and we'll go to there. And click there. All right, so hopefully you can see my uh, multi-dimensional. <laughs> Terrific. So uh, here we are. Let me actually switch my screen real quick. We have a system in place. This, uh, this is my demo. It's right here over my shoulder. And as you can see, we've got an Epic here, and it's connected to numerous data sources. You know, we've got a turbine here. We've got some stack lights. 
Uh, we've got some other IO, you know, temperatures where we're actually collecting data from other sources, including the building power, the building I'm in right now. And we're going to collect all this data and we're going to move it up to a broker. Now I'm doing this currently. So I have a client, an MQTT client in here now that is publishing this data to my own Hive MQ broker. And if I uh, switch this around back, let's do it that way. You'll see there that uh, with this display, indeed, I'm, you know, I've got the Epic connected to various devices. And then here's my little PC here where I'm actually presenting from. It's on the IT side of the network. All my devices are our protected OT network. And I have, again, currently configured using, uh, in this case, Ignition Edge to publish my data into first my own broker. And this is a demo that's been working for some time. Uh, and then indeed I come over here to Ignition and I can see uh, through my GrooveView software, all of that data in real time from a cloud broker. Let me give you an idea what that looks like. I'll come over to here and at uh, demo.groove.com, I can log in with the username and password. I think we're gonna be pasting that into the, uh, into the chat uh, so that you can actually log in and see this yourself. Uh, for this part, though, I'm actually logging in as a developer, um, and we'll go ahead and do that. I'm going to scroll down to the Epic Opto Turbine, and this is the working system. So again, I've got the Epic in, uh, out here in Temecula, publishing up to my own instance of HiveMQ, subscribing to that data with an ignition gateway, and building uh, this screen here, which is a GrooveView dashboard uh, showing everything. So right from here, I can control things there. I just turned on the turbine. You should see it going on <laughs> down there beneath me. I've got access to, of course, some stack lights there. You can see it's very high performance. And this is going through a Hive MQ broker that's actually in Germany. So everything's very, very fast. I can turn on uh, stack lights and so on. So as part of this presentation, as part of this workshop, what we wanted to do is take an existing system just like you see here and we're gonna spin up another MQTT client and connect it to a brand new broker. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna turn off my turbine here. It's a little bit noisy behind me. And I'm gonna scroll over to uh, this page again. First thing I'm gonna do is log right into this Epic. And by doing that, I just open up a browser window and I have a shortcut here that goes to my Epic turbine. And just as I described before, I must log in. So I've got my username and password there. And this is the dashboard. This is Groove Manage, where I can access all of the uh, services, software, uh, configurations, everything from one screen. I'll start off with accounts because that's most important. Obviously, I just logged in with an account locally to the Epic, but I can also set up accounts through LDAP. So now we can actually use you know, Active Directory or any other LDAP services to manage the accounts on a PLC. <laughs> Not many PLCs can do that. Uh, but moving right along, security, I said, was, was critical. So all of your certificate management is all handled right from this screen, whether they're server certificates or even if you needed to upload any client certificates to the local trust store. Also of note is the firewall. So this device has multiple network interfaces. So I have all the different services that are running on this device and the ability to very granularly protect this device or close or open ports based on my needs. So this becomes really important for, you know, uh, for IT, we want to block all incoming ports and only transmit data out, which is what we're going to be doing uh, for this exercise. So what data am I working with? Well, in this case, I have a controller, a real-time control program running on the device. And this particular Epic allows you to, uh, gives you choices. You can use CodeSys, you want to develop an IEC 611.31, or our own pack control flowchart based software, which we've had for 30 years. Both of these are included. There's no charge for any of this software that I'm describing. Uh, so if I go in, I'm actually am using a pack control strategy that is running on that Epic. And I can see that is indeed running. I've got six different tasks that are running. It's a multitasking uh, environment. So this is the system that I'm going to pull the tags from. So naturally there's some IO tags there. There's some variables, there's some arrays. Lots of information right inside the control program. So what I want to do uh, for this exercise is I want to take those, uh, take all that data and send it, send it to a brand new HiveMQ broker that Kudzai is going to spin up right live for us and start publishing that data. So to, to do that, I'm going to use something called the data service. Now, my data service is a way that I can create different kinds of data services. 
And currently I do have the OPC in there. We do have OPC UA server, but what I want to do is set up this device for this particular workshop because my other MQT client is doing everything else uh, for the standard demo. So the first thing I need to do is set up, where is the data coming from? Well, it's coming from the local pack controller, that strategy I just described. I'm going to enable it and I'm gonna give it a device ID. This becomes part of the MQTT topic namespace. There's three parts, the group ID, the edge node ID, and the device ID. So I just indicated the device ID, and then I can determine on that one, what are some of the different protocols I want to use to move that data out? Uh, in this case, I can choose string, uh, MQTT string, spark plug, OPC UA server. For this exercise, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on spark plug. So I'm just gonna set it just like that and click save. Now I've created a data connection. Next thing is I need to now create the spark plug B connector to the Hive MQ broker. So I'm gonna click into here. And right now I've got this, uh, I've got the spark plug protocol, it's enabled. And I'm gonna start putting in um, uh, the rest of the topic namespace. In this case, I'm gonna go opto 22. Uh, so that'll be the group ID. And then opto turbine, will be my edge node ID. We're gonna leave the rest of these settings default. There's a lot of configuration options in here that outside of the scope of this uh, workshop, uh, but that's pretty much it as in terms of setting it up. The final thing is I have to add a broker, but I don't have a broker yet. So with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Kudzai. Kudzai, give me a broker and some credentials I can log into that, please. And I'll stop my share. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Benson. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is how simple it is to actually uh, uh, provision an MQTT broker on the Hive MQ Cloud. So if you're on the Hive MQ website, you simply go to Cloud, click on Hive MQ Cloud, and then it's going to bring up this page, and then you can click on Sign Up. So if you are doing it for the first time. You, you are going to go through a few simple steps to uh, actually fill in your email, uh, username and password. And then as soon as you do that, you actually see the, the screen that I'm actually looking at right now. It will automatically provision a new MQTT broker for you. So it's literally just a few clicks. You've already got a fully functional MQTT broker. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, actually create a new broker cluster. So as you can see, it's just a matter of one button. So if I click on that, and then you can see that uh, actually uh, I'm, I'm using the, a free version, which gives me a maximum of two um, uh, broker clusters. And then I can select uh, here which uh, cloud platform I, I want to host that uh, broker in. So I'll select AWS and then click on uh, create cluster. And then just like that, I've uh, created an MQTT broker. So now I need to uh, get the details for Benson to start publishing information to this broker. So what I'll do is I'll go to manage cluster. And then as you can see here, I've got my uh, uh, cluster URL, right? And then I've got the port number. So this is all secured. And then now I need to create a, a username and, uh, and password for the MQTT client to be able to uh, make a connection to this broker. And to do that, I go to access management. And then here I'll give, uh, I'll create a username. While he's doing that, um, one of the things that I personally really enjoy about the way HiveMQ has set this up is that, I don't know if you noticed uh, to the audience, but there was no credit card required yeah. for their free version. I love that. I've I've created probably a dozen of these to use for my own demos. Uh, and so if you're out there in the audience and you, and you wanna give this a shot, help HiveMQ out, reward their uh, diligence in being here today and and create your own cluster for free while Kudzai is doing it. And uh, Jeff, if I'm not mistaken, and Kudza, you can confirm, I think that's uh, free for 100 devices. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So with this free version, you can actually connect up to 100 devices. Yeah, well, we're going to get to the pricing at the end, Benson. I am just <laughs> so excited that it's 100 devices. I can't, I can't hold back. Uh, right, yeah, so one. just like that, I've got my broker up and running. So I've, got, I've created uh, some uh, access management details. So I'll simply copy this uh, broker URL. And then I'll pass this over to Benson. Are you putting it in the chat for me? Yep. Awesome. And then 
we can, uh, we're now ready to start uh, receiving uh, messages on this program. So bring it back to you, Benson. Okay, so I'm gonna once again, share my screen and there we go. And let me go ahead and stop that video and go back to this screen. So here I am where I left off. I've got my MQTT broker configuration there. I've just copied to my clipboard the URL that uh, Kudzai just provided me. So that's my endpoint. So I'm going to put that in there. And then in our configuration, I suffix that with the port that I want to connect to. Uh, Kudzai set this up on 8883. Uh, and that's important because the 8883 port is the secure port. Let's see if we can type that in properly. There we go. So now that's configured. I can give it any random unique ID. So I'll just put something in there uh, like, uh, like this and uh, username and password. So let's make sure I type this in properly. Nobody look while I'm top typing because I, uh, I can't type when people are watching. Okay, so I've got my uh, username and password. We are using SSL, so I'll go ahead and check that. There's some other configurations as, as well here, client certs, cert auth key. Those aren't required because MQTT or HiveMQ's MQTT broker uses user pass authentication, but some other brokers actually require certificates. So that's why that's there, not needed in this case. So I'm going to click OK, and I've got all my configuration there. I got my broker added. I'm going to click Save. And now the, the drum roll, I'm going to enable this data service. So this will take a few minutes to kind of collect, you know, start up the service. It'll go catalog all the tags from the pack control strategy, all my IO and variables, catalog those up, put them into an MQTT, what's called a birth message, and send that up to the broker. This allows other clients to receive the birth message and see all my tags. Nobody has to re-enter any tags into their system. I'm publishing all that information directly. Now, we're gonna, as this starts to come through, there's one other thing I wanted to show you. Back on my main demo here, and we're, we'll pass the credentials so that you guys can um, uh, actually interact with this live if you like. Uh, Jeff, I think I put that in the chat. You can share with the audience. Done. They've got it. But the, the other thing I've got on here is a Canary historian. So I have been collecting and histor historizing data from my demo for quite a while, uh, several months. So what I was able to do was take a look at all this data and export it as a CSV file. And I have sent that over to a, peri uh, to a Perio for all the historical data. But in just a few moments, you'll see how a Perio is now looking at the real-time data as well. So I don't wanna give too much away there, but that's essentially what's happening there. So as I turn on the turbine, that is a message that just occurred here at the Epic, sent it up to the broker. All subscribers are gonna now get a status that I started the turbine. All of this is report by exception, all of it's secure, and all of it's outbound. So that pretty much wraps up uh, my portion of the demo. I guess you could say it's uh, pretty straightforward, just filling in a few blanks. So I'll stop share. All right, Kyle, where do we go next? From here, I believe we head over to uh, Ron and Peter. Uh, to start working through um, showing how they pull in the live data through the MQTT broker. All right. So we'll let Ron and Peter get their screen set up and started. And I just want to go ahead and thank, uh, we've had a dozen folks already sign up on the Integrate Live uh, community. And that forum needs your support for it to grow, we've got to start getting some good exchanges uh, as part of this data launch. So thank you all for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, we can see your screen uh, nice and clear. Yeah, so this is obviously before uh, any data has arrived. It should be arriving shortly. So we went from California to Germany. We are now, I think, getting to Germany to get it back here. And get it back to where? So we're in Tel Aviv. Israel, so it's a, it's going to be a global, truly global uh, uh, workshop. Workshop here. Fantastic. Well, while we wait for that data to show up, um, I have another dad joke. We can interject in the in the, in the interim. <laughs> uh, so everybody, what did the uh, evil chicken lay? 
I don't know. What did it? Yeah, I it, no laid, idea. it laid deviled eggs. Deviled eggs. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's perfect. Nice Leveled up the- my dad game since last time. <laughs> so, there you go. While that is coming in, I wanted to ask Sean on your side, on the Canary side, are you getting, uh, do you see data coming in on the broker? I do. I've already connected through our MQTT collector and I'm getting data coming in. Okay. I'd like to shift over real quick. Then if we can, uh, we're going to come back to a period. Um, Sean, show me if you would kind of on the Canary side, how you would set up that logging, how would you use filters um, and, and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me go ahead here and share hey, my Sean, screen. Sean, while you're doing that, uh, I have to tell you, my wife uh, accused me of stealing her thesaurus yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I was not only shocked, I was appalled, I was aghast, and I was dismayed. <laughs> it's oh. a good thesaurus joke. I actually had to, I had to get rid of my, uh, I had to throw my thesaurus away. Um, it was terrible. And it was terrible. It was, it was terrible. It, I don't have any other words to describe it. It's, since we're on the topic of books, I'm, I'm reading one. It's very interesting about anti-gravity. I cannot put it down. Can't put it down. <laughs> so, right, uh, if you started seeing the data, uh, you can share the screen and talk about it if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll oh, go yeah. back out. Okay. We'll, sorry. We'll let's keep our normal order. Go back to it, Aperio. Ah, sorry. Um, was, it just, was it just delayed or did you have a quick configuration change? I, I, I think it was a delay. Uh, okay. So um, the way that um, typically machine learning works with, with OT is we need a set of data in order to train the models now, uh, the machine learning models. Now, this is a brand uh, new empty system that we, that we brought up specifically for this event. And um, if I refresh the screen, I will start seeing that we started seeing data flowing to, uh, to this right now. So this is the, the data which uh, is being published by Benson. And we can take a look at the, at the signal plot of the data that arrives right now. By the way, it's, uh, as Peter said, we, we are live from uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, and the time here now is uh, 6 p.m., 6.53, so you can see that this data is current. This, this is the data that we're actually receiving. Now, um, when Apio got enough data to start uh, training the, the machine learning models, you will see that the engines here that are the default engines that come with the system, it's part of 20 something engines that, that, that we have in Dota, uh, will start becoming uh, green. Uh, so the second uh, inv- pure environment that we made for this, uh, for this webinar is an environment uh, which is preloaded with some sensor data that we got in advance from Benson, and we are publishing the data to two environment to the both environments environments at the same time. Hey Ron, can I ask uh, just for clarity? Typically, how many data points does your system like or need for those engines to start in, enabling and and uh, generating alerts? So oh, the, the, the non-specific answer is the more, the better. So yeah. if, you, if you guys are using Canary uh, as a historian and you can export um, the data in advance, it will allow us to first train the models and, and then you will, um, you, you will see like better results almost immediately. If we don't have history at all, we usually require about three weeks of data to train the model. And from that moment, you can start getting machine learning alerts and events for everything that we see. Yeah, and that three weeks is just a rough, it's not, because if you have something that's a really slow acting um, data point, it's gonna take a lot longer, right? So you need a couple hundred thousand or more data points for this thing really to kick in, right? 
Correct. And, and, and we know that like with, with the environment that we are showing here, we typically get a uh, one second sample rate for everything. Since that's the case, uh, the three weeks is, is actually calculated on, on the one second sample rate. And to that point, as if you listen to this and this is something that interests you, then you may want to consider uh, tuning your dead band for this broker. Um, that way, because if you have dead bands in that are restricting the amount of updates for the period of time to get this trained, you may want to, to tune those down so that you can get the data into the system. That will get you a little bit faster. But the reality is, if you can get the history and you have it, then then you don't have to, you can just get that data to Aperio and then go from there. So. And that's, and that's essentially what we're getting ready to replicate. Is that right, Alan? We're going to show, right. hey, we've made the live connection. And if we, this is kind of like the, uh, the, the cooking shows on TV, right? Where they put the turkey in the top oven. Yeah. Uh, and, and we could hang out for four hours or three weeks, uh, but they pull the turkey out of the bottom oven that's been baking for four hours. And so is that what we're getting ready to show? Yeah, now? let's go ahead and what we'll do. So we've shown the... The period the connection. connecting to the broker, subscribing to it. We have the data in, in their default, but they literally not, no alerts are going to happen until we get enough history to enable things. So now let's switch back to Canary and talk about how do we go about getting that history? Okay. All right. Let me go, go ahead here and share my screen again. And in previous Integrate Lives, um, we have shown how to historize MQTT data um, actually from a Hive broker using Canary's collector. So we don't necessarily need to go through all of those steps again. IntegrateLive.com, you can get the entire archive of all of our previous rundowns and virtual workshops uh, from the website. And so if you want to see how to do those steps, go back to the Canary Hive MQ um, Kepware. I think episode one, um, yep. you'll see that. So Sean, how do we get a history feed into a Perio and get them started? Yeah, so there. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So there's a, there's a few ways. I, I think really uh, probably the the way we would go typically would be through our our uh, API. Um, now I don't have you know a nice fancy user interface to really show you, uh, but what I am showing you here is that our our available online documentation one making the calls to get the data from our AP or from our historian using our API. Um, now, probably the most common way, um, this is, this is an interactive document. Um, and you, and you know, if anyone's interested, it's readapi.canarylabs.com and then forward slash 21.4 forward slash. Um, but there's different methods uh, to go about getting the data. Um, you know, probably the, the most uh, common way uh, we would set up as using the the get tag data. So this is where we go to get raw or processed data, and we give you you know the the usage and then the the parameters that you can include in your call to get the data. So this is all like I said interactive. So you can go through and see you know how you know how do I you know start with my access token? How do I create start times, end times, aggregate names and intervals so I can you know kind of you know get get specific with the data that I want to query. And include into in this case a Perio. Um, now there's a little bit involved in, in setting up on the Aperio side, but this is, I guess, kind of in theory, you know, how, what we would be doing uh, in a real use case. Now there's other methods to get data out of Canary. I'm going to show you those as well. Um, probably the most common way. And you've already had a glimpse of Axiom with uh, with Benson, uh, but here I just have a, a simple trend chart, trending data. But let's say there's a couple uh, a couple pieces of data I'd like to export from this chart. Um, in Axiom, I can go to my main menu, and there's an export data option. And this is where I'll choose uh, what data points I want to export to CSV. Let's just say I'm, I'm you know I want to export these two data points, and then I can get more specific now with the amount of data that I want to export. So I can choose my my range of data. You know, maybe I would like to start from the beginning of the month or just, uh, you know, last night at midnight, I can adjust, you know, the amount of data that I'm going to export that way. Um, and it's going to allow me then to pick my aggregate interval. You know, maybe I'm looking at, you know, I would like to see, you know, 30 minute average or, you know, maybe even more granular, maybe, you know, five minute average data. 
um, you know, John, uh, if you wanted raw, if you wanted raw data, how would you set that up? Yeah, if I just if I just want raw data, um, then I'm just going to make it a zero sec. I'm zero, not my aggregate interval. Um, and then you can see how the the row count uh, went from the amount of rows in the CSV just to raw. So it's going to pull in all the raw data now in that in this case just an hour interval. So I'm going to leave it in an hour because I don't want to try to query a month of data into Excel that could take a little time. But I'm just going to export that. And that generates my CSV file here. I'll go ahead, just opening that up so you can have a look at that. So here's the actual data for that tag. Yeah, I can see all the raw data uh, for both those tags uh, right here on in my CSV file. So that's a real quick way just to dump data from a chart. Now, what, what I prefer, uh, because I am limited here just to the amount of data or to the specific data that was on that trend chart, but if I would like to get more specific than just the data in the trend chart, um, then I could go over to our Excel add-in tool. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, when you open up Excel, there would be a Canary Labs ribbon bar, okay? And what I just need to do is, first of all, you know, pick my, my from my tag list here. So, I can go and search my historian either for the raw data or, and again, we talked about this in previous sessions with our virtual views, I could pick a view of the data and even pick a specific asset if I want to. And within that asset, I could even filter based on a tag name. So, here I'm looking just for temperatures. And I can specifically select a few temperature tags that I want to query the data for. And then I can say, hey, you know what? I'd like to query process data for those three tags. So, so now I can come in and just set my uh, input range here. And then I can put in a start time, like, you know, maybe now minus the last eight hours up till now. So I just, in this case, I just want to look at eight hours of data I want to pull in and export. And maybe I want to do that on one 30 minute interval. So just every 30 minutes, I want to see what the average temperature was in this case. And um, so, you know, with with that being said, um, go ahead and output this. So here here's here's that data. I just I have the every 30 minute average for each of the tags. And I, if I wanted to get a little better presentation here, actually, let me just uh, reverse that and say output vertically for these three tags. Set that and say, OK. So here's a much better format. So you can see every 30 minutes, here's the average temperature for those three tags. So I didn't have to go into Axiom and trend those tags. I could just go right into Excel using our add-in tool. And now I've had the data the, exactly the way I want it. And so, so you could have done that in raw format and then use this as your uh, way to upload to Aperio. Is that what I'm understanding as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could have I chose raw data, did the same thing, and pulled in just the raw data. I'd have had a lot more entries, of course. I you know, narrowed it down to 30-minute averages. But yes, I could do a massive data pool you know, into Excel and the CSV that way. Yeah. So Kyle, from your integrator hat, um, are you going to favor typically make the connection for the web API for uh, for a, you know, a one-time data upload or CSV file? What's your preference? It, it depends on... on what, what the customer is using, but for the most part, because I, I have the, 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 the dev background, I love APIs, <laughs> so I, that's my favorite part. And then, then plus it's dynamic and you can always continually use it. And once you build a system and, and build a build a path, then right. I and, again, uh, again. Canary dev team got you guys, got everybody started, uh, dropped a uh, bit of sample code, a link to the GitHub for Canary Labs into the chat. So if anybody does want to explore that, you can get a head start. Um, also, from me wearing a canary hat, um, look on Canary's YouTube channel and look for I ran Postman and, and demonstrated this live uh, in the YouTube video. It takes about 20 minutes to set it up. So pretty quick. Awesome. Let's jump back over Perio and let's look at actual some data with some machine learning engines active and uh, go from there. It's turkey time. That's right, it's turkey time. Time so now it's uh, three weeks later. I prefer, I prefer cakes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a turkey pie, I'm trying to please everyone. Done. So it's three weeks later because time flies in good company. And you see now how these colors are the detection from the machine learning engines. One point to clarify so Ron talked about the engines building models, and that all happens automatically. So Aperio optimizes for automation to achieve scale. And that means we connect like was demonstrated and then the system goes to work. And basically you can lean back, wait three weeks. You don't have to do any manual configuration. The, the whole idea is that this is automated. 
So looking at, for example, building power, one of the tags that we've gotten historical data uh, for from Canary, if we have a look at what, what the engines say about that. So one thing to notice, just to get that out of the way, in the middle, we had a big gap in the data set between June and, and early August, right? And, but obviously, the diligent engine picks that up. Now we have ways where the system will both learn if this is normal behavior or not. And as a user, you can also say, okay, I got it. I don't need to see this anymore. So let's start with some outer ranges. Now this is building power consumption, obviously. So we have your five work days and then what should be the weekend, a shorter work week here, but otherwise five work days. Now you'll see the green markings appear here, those are the out of range engine. So what, what's actually going on is that the building power consumption has a certain profile that the machine learning engine learns. And then it'll put the engines to work, detect and notify if anything is out of order. And this is where, let's try and just remove this for a second. With the naked eye, it can be very difficult to say which of these are in order and which of these are not. I mean, maybe this one sort of visually looks out of order, but this one, maybe, maybe not. This one, difficult to say. So the power of machine learning is really that unequivocally, you will know, okay, the obvious ones were caught, great, but what about the less obvious ones? So if we take this sequence here, for example, zooming in and having the indication from a period you can actually almost see with the naked eye that there is, that does appear to be a different average level in this part of the sequence and in this part of the sequence. So this is building power, California, maybe air conditioned units were turned on. There can be many explanations and with the period you can dive into and understand what is actually going on. So obviously for, with this chicken pie, uh, sorry, turkey pie, chicken pie, turkey pie example, you know, this is, it may be perfectly normal, but it may also be something that requires investigation because as you see, it doesn't happen every day. And so maybe there's a weather difference between late May and early June, maybe not, maybe something else is going on. And all of this is stuff that you can easily dive into with the power of a peer's machine learning engine because they will point you to where you need to look. Similarly, if we look at, at, at the other end of the, of the signal here, we have more uh, uh, sort of, seems to be more the, the, the norm still that we have this spike towards the end of the day, but then also a day where something else, you know, is, is, seems to sort of go, go a little bit lower. Maybe this is some optimum that you could actually configure the building energy consumption towards and then save energy in that way. Because if it's possible to operate the building at this power level, why not all the time, for example? But this is, uh, this, this is getting, you know, in, into, the, into the sort of depths of, of if, if I can interject with a use case, uh, Opto22 went through this. Uh, we didn't have this tool, but we, we have been collecting our energy data uh, for over a decade to do exactly what you described. How do we save energy? Because what you're looking at there is what's called demand. That's the actual power the building uses. The problem that we were trying to solve was the way the electric companies charge you for electricity is really in two ways. One, how much energy you use, that's consumption, like fuel in your gas tank and your car, that's how much consumption. But the second is what's called the demand charge. And the demand charge is how much energy you use at any given moment. Essentially, it's in a 15 minute interval. And then they zap you for that. So let's go back to the car analogy. If I'm driving down the freeway and I get it up to hundred mile an hour, that gets latched and you pay the demand charge based on the most demand you had in a 15 minute interval throughout your billing cycle. That was a bigger part of our bill than the consumption. So having these kinds of tools allows you to identify where those high demands are and start to trim them down. Now, while we had to look at regular data and you know drill in and spend a lot of time discovering that, this tool would have made it a lot simpler to really drill down on those particular times of day where my demand gets above a certain point. So that's uh, that's very powerful, and that's you know a use case uh, that we're doing all over the all over the country, particularly with energy costs on the rise. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And just to complete the view here, obviously these are the new tags that 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 have just been connected. So they're now in the process of aggregating data and uh, and preparing for. Preparing for insight generation. This one actually has data. This one, 
Yeah, so here we see, th this is one of the newly connected ones here, coming in from around 6.52 here local time. So uh, no engines working, that's expected, but yeah, give it, uh, give it a few weeks and, then, and then, then you'll start to see the insights. One of the ones that are interesting to me is the, the flat line, because I know that there has been talk, and I think we were even talking about it at a different setting where it's, it's easy to, to see a, by the human eye that looks like there's a flat line, but then there's actually not. Did you find that in this data at all? I think we had one of those examples. Uh, that has bit us before where we thought, oh, this is not a flat line, but it was, or worse. I yeah. So I think we had here on the turbine temperature, we had an example of that where this, this is actually a, a, a moving the zoom window around here so I can see my whole screen. So here, this is a good example where in the beginning of, of the data consumption, the machine learnings, learning engines are training, meaning they, they take an outset in the data provided and they, they do some work to understand from the raw data what is expected normal behavior. And that's what they then start alerting on. And we see in the training period, there were a few drops to zero. And what happens is that the flatline engine will have understood that, okay, drops to zero is not for that engine to be concerned with. So we actually then spotted this area, actually we saw it because we had another flatline here. Next to it is an instance where the signal drops to zero and then the flatline engine doesn't react because it's part of the data history. Now we have another engine uh, that we haven't activated here that would capture stuff like this. But this also goes to show the value of the different engines because they will allow you as a user to understand what's going on. Are we dealing with a flat line that's materially different than dealing with no data, for example, which is what we have here. You know, we had no data. We received the last historical data point 27th of August. Ron just hooked us up now. Obviously, there's a, there's a no data period here in, in the meantime. And without the right tools, no data might be interpreted as flat lines. Flat lines might be interpreted as stable operations. And going, going in this sort of you know, circularity, all hell can quickly break loose. So that's where the engines will, will help you understand what's going on. Is it flat lines? Is it out of range? Which is again different from an abrupt change alert, uh, for example, that we have. We have a few abrupt changes also. And I can't uh, tell you how many times as especially as a formal leader working with software developers, getting the phone call from operations telling us, hey, this thing has been flatlined for days. And like until somebody tells us we don't know there's a problem, where now we can not just know if it's flatlined, but we'll know if it's if it's no data or if it's rate of change, whatever it is, right? So now you have a, a much richer tool set to actually one be notified before operations notifies you and two be able to actually go in and see is it a flat line is it no data what is the actual problem so great um i know we're bumping up on our time is there anything else peter you wanted to show before we start talking about pricing so a very um, quick look a very very quick look because obviously you know when we talk about scalability that's when the dashboard comes into play so just a quick look at a dashboard one of our uh, demo dashboards that has a bit more data loaded. And you can see that, okay, we have a substantial number of potential events. And then as a user, you have tools to start working through that in an efficient manner, because obviously you're not gonna start checking 273 events over a seven day period, just like one by one. What you wanna do is you wanna break it down, like Alan says, according to problem type, according to potential underlying issue or potential cause. And the dashboard essentially helps you do that. So imagine now if you are not at 189 channels, but 189,000 channels, for example, just add three zeros, and this becomes really powerful. Out of range is a problem here, and noise change, so the, the, the different quantization on a signal. That's the problems in this data set. You can probably start there and disregard no data, for example. So with that, I think with can the you time- show, Can you show the, the, the DQI real quick? Because I think that's important to understand that you have a, the ability to looking uh, back on your other uh, on your demo one. Yeah, I, I don't have the DQI roll up here because it, it has to come from the channel explorer. 
Got it. So go back to that one. So, but, but here's the reality for, for what I was trying to get to. You can come to this screen and you can get the actual call to action on what you need to go work on. Right. So you can come in here and you can see all your tags and you can filter. So all of your DQI, low DQI is at the top. Now I actually have something I can go work on. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm super excited about where we can take this and what we can do with it. And uh, from there, Jeff, I think I'll hand it off to you. Okay. And talk about pricing. Yeah, let's. Uh, I should probably be prepared to do that, huh? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And to Jim. All right. And to me. Um, I was just enjoying sitting back and uh, enjoying the show. Let me. Uh, I saw a funny meme that said the uh, word spoken by every sales guy. Let me share my screen. Uh, <laughs> the new reality. All right. So as we talk about pricing, let's just break through what we have seen uh, and uh, and we'll move from there. All right, so um, the Opto Groove Epic, uh, Benson, uh, right around three thousand dollars, based on what you've demonstrated today. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty close. It's a processor, a power supply, a chassis, and then I have four I/O modules on this particular device. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much in the ballpark. Okay. And so, what we're really trying to show here is, if you wanted to get started with a proof of concept and come back, rewatch this and duplicate the work that you've done. This is, this is what we would say you would probably want to do for a proof of concept. So a Groove Epic, uh, HiveMQ, love those words, free. Thank you, Kudzai. Thank you to the HiveMQ team for doing that. Now, the caveat is it's 100 devices um, and up to 10 gigs of data per month. So that you could move into a paid situation depending on how much data you're going to move. Um, but how awesome is it you can get started with free and HiveMQ publishes all of their pricing fully transparent on the website. We thank them for that. Um, Canary, you're looking at, you could either invest, am I right, Sean, in buying a Canary system for $4,000 um, and then it's yours forever. Or you could just say, hey, I want to subscribe um, on payment. I'll host it myself. And that's about $135 a month. Yeah, 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 you're you're right, Jeff. It, that's that's right, right spot on. Um, yeah, subscriptions there for those that don't have the capital want to just go you know monthly for a while, and it's optional. They can walk away if they need to, but uh, the options there. Okay, and then they could grow that. They don't have to reinvest. They've already bought this. You know, they could increase the tag count. They could scale it as they grow. Um, yeah, that's the other nice flexible thing. E either option, they can scale as they grow. We don't we don't force anyone to buy more than what they need. They can add later, and and no no problem. Okay, cool. And then here's the other really, uh, Apirio, uh, Ron, Peter, um, Greg. I think you're on as well. Listening, thank you for this. Apirio said, "Hey, if you want to try some machine learning right now, and you want to uh, start monitoring your data quality." Um, from a enterprise level, we're going to give you a free sample of how this works. So same thing, 100 tags, single user. There will be limits on the amount of alerts and the alerts that they offer, but go do it for free and try it. So $3,000, grab an opto, I've imputed free. If you need a historian for this, um, great. Canary will give you some flexible ways to do that. Uh, Aperio and HiveMQ, thank you, giving you a free way to test this out. Uh, did I miss anything on pricing, guys? Did we get it wrapped pretty well? Yep. And okay. uh, we'll Good. put in the uh, website to Aperio in case you wanted to contact them and get started. Thank you. I would be curious from just a show of hands from our audience, is anybody going to take Aperio up on this and uh, give us a little heck yeah uh, sign me up in the chat if uh, James Booth's raised his hand. So uh, Ron, Peter, oh, two, three, four. We got people raising their hands. So thank you for doing that for them. Now I'm going to put you on the spot and uh, move into questions. Ask the panel. I've got one. Um, so Peter, I, I, me personally, just speaking for me, I hate the idea of stranding data in platforms, right? So we're going to do this really cool thing. We're going to go we're going to keep it open. We're going to use Sparkplug. We're going to 
get you data and you're doing cool stuff with it. What's a period's long-term plan for if I don't want to alert just inside of the Aperio software, right? But I want to send data back out of Aperio, back into my ecosystem. Talk me through how long-term I'd be able to get that back to Benson on the edge. What are you thinking on that? Yeah, totally. I mean, it doesn't stop with data quality, right? You need data is only valuable because you apply it to something somewhere. So we want our insights to go along with that. Our vision is basically around data actionability. We know data observability has been a big thing for a while now, but we want to take it a step further and say, you don't need to just look at the data. As a user, you need actual good data at your fingertips. So we have a variety of ways where we can deliver our insights with the data set in, in more or less scrubbed manners, depending on user pref uh, preferences. And that, that is a big dimension of the product that we are still building out. So essentially, as a user, you can choose to, to have the Aperio Insights overlaid the data set. You can have it as a, as a second data set where you have some modification as per the Aperio Insights. One thing that we don't do is we don't create a duplicate database. So we're not out to become a historian. So we sit out of band and we monitor and, and we provide insights and then we can do things with, with those insights. So it's supposed to be really lightweight uh, and, and efficient in terms of not duplicating services that are already running. And we yeah. also add that, that alert uh, the, uh, MQTT eventually yeah. you don't have that capability yet but you're going you're going to have that and email and i believe some you have other slack. Couple email slack sms whatsapp uh we we can do those today uh, more than that we have an api that allows uh, pretty much everyone to connect um another benefit of a period is um so many many uh customers use a period uh, to send data to their analytics uh, software. Because today, if your data is, uh, is, is not with good quality and you send it to analytics system, the analytics reports that you get uh, will not be accurate. So if you know to fix all the data and to clean the data so uh, it will be ready for analytic systems. Nice, that's great. All right, um, let's take a few more of the questions that have come in. If you have a question and we haven't answered it already, to your satisfaction, yell at us. Um, Sean, I've got a question that's come in from Clint. Mm -hmm. uh, Clint had a question around the API um, feature set. So mm -hmm. um, does the API support the ability to do a wildcard for the tag name? So a good example of this would be um, and just Clint, I'm ad living for you, so yell if I'm off. But uh, I know I've got a, a, a PV of temp, right? But I've got uniqueness in the tag name up to that. I just want to get all temp tags, uh, all of my temperature tags. So is there a way to do that in the API with a wildcard? Yeah, yeah. So you can have a tag browse path. Uh, so we have the, the get tag data method, and there's a parameter um, called string path. And so you can put in that uh that call you know like like you were saying jeff like maybe you know something starting with like plant one or line one and including any tag with temperature.pv like you were saying so you can get very specific on that call using that string path inside of the uh, get tag data okay um clint if you want to dig more into that sean will you type and pass in the uh the read api documentation where they can find that Absolutely, I'll do that right now. All right. Um, Durga asked some questions as well of Aperio. Um, Durga, did you get that, Ron, did you get that question answered already? Uh, answering it as, a, as we speak, I think. Um, I, I just wanna maybe, uh, Durga, maybe you can uh, clarify a bit about the question. Uh, when, when you say KPIs for a specific machine, exactly what you mean? All right, we'll let Durga, we'll let Durga get that clarification and I'll come back if we get it. Um, there was a question that came in for Opto I think would be beneficial for everybody um, to hear. Um, Vincent, data being sent as a quality of service one or two uh, question, uh, which one? And I think you said what, one? 
as part of the spark plug spec? Yeah, it's it's actually built into the specs. So you don't have to indicate a QoS, uh, but yep. it is one, meaning we're going to send it and guarantee delivery. But what's more important is the connection to the MQTT broker is persistent. So we'll, the broker always knows the state of all the clients, all the systems in the field. Uh, and indeed, if that connection is cut for whatever reason, the edge device, in this case, the Epic, will start storing that data until reconnection is established. Uh, and then we'll forward all of that data up. So you, you really don't lose any data. Um, yeah. And QS2 is you know getting a, an acknowledgement on every data point set. Uh, that's a lot of traffic uh, that has right. been uh, um, you know, addressed with the Sparkplug B spec. Yeah, and so this comes into Benson, if I'm not mistaken, the primary application or primary host ID feature, right? You could designate mm -hmm. Canary um, as the primary host, and that means Canary is going to get all of that buffered data as the historian sent to it from the Edge application um, if that uh, if, if comms are lost. Indeed, and those tag values are marked historical, so Canary knows what to do with them. How to insert. Perfect. Uh, we should just put a little flag on that feature because keep in mind, if you use that, that means that if Canary goes away, right? Let's say that IT is running a server upgrade on Canary and Canary is not available, Benson, if I'm not mistaken, that's going to cause the Groove Epic as part of primary host to buffer data that would normally go to the broker that maybe the SCADA system would want to be reading also. Am I wrong? Or am Potentially, I right? yes. And that's why we also have multiple MT MQTT clients. So we may Perfect. be serving SCADA. We may be serving a historian. We may be serving a Perio. All of them can use the same broker, or we can identify different connect client connections to different brokers. There we go. So a dual broker setup ensures that all applications uh, are getting data, even if your primary host is offline. Nice. Good answer. All right. Did we get any follow-up clarification? Yeah, uh, Ron answered it. Okay. For the group, um, Ron, you want to give the group the quick answer on that? Sorry, yes. So uh, we actually get this question, if I understand the question correctly, we get this question uh, quite a lot. Customers are asking what sensor information should we send to a period uh, in order to discover our issues or our quality issues or in order to create workflows. Uh, our answer is usually very simple, send everything. A period was built for performance uh, we, we, we can ingest millions of tags on, on a single environment. And once you send all of your tags and sensors to a Perio, we can show you uh, where quality is an issue. Uh, also, many of, our, many of our customers have uh, multi-production sites and multi-production lines within the same site. So with the Perio, you can also focus on, you can get a global report of your quality, and then you can focus on the quality of each uh, site or plant or, or meal. And within that site and, and, uh, and meal, you can also get uh, the quality report for specific production lines and know where you stand. I think uh, I'll give you the the answer that I would recommend too. If you're looking at testing it, um, go pick that skid or that process that you're having problems with, and and get the data from that process to Aperio and let their machine learning start to tell you the whole story on what's happening. Right. So, in oil and gas. If I had a free water knockout that I was having a, a ton of issues with, then I would take all the transmitters from that free water knockout, the inlets, the outlets, everything internal of it and send it to Aperio and let that just churn through that data and start to tell me where my, my issues are at. And you think about, you start thinking about like control loops, right? You start to see how those control loops are happening with the quality that can be very uh, beneficial. Thanks, Alan. Um... And I want to make sure, I hope I'm pronouncing uh, your name correctly. Uh, Helcio, uh, you asked, is Canary going to offer a free version? Uh, I've dropped Sean's email inside of the chat for everybody. Sean, if they email you and ask for a, uh, a, a trial version so they can run their POC and do this with Hive and Imperio, are you cool with that? Oh, absolutely. I'd welcome that. So yeah, please email me. I'll get. I'll make I that happen. I give you my credit card. 
<laughs> you can do that too, Alan. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a special rate. Actually, I'll go ahead and drop Alan's credit card in the chat <laughs> as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, Garrett says, uh, do you support Pi? Aperio said yes. Um, and then also, how about pulling the data from ODBC? That's a thumbs up from Canary, ODBC connector. Um, Aperio, do you have a ODBC uh, capabilities? Uh, no, we don't really have ODBC connector. Uh, I will rephrase. We have an inbound uh, ODBC connector. So we know how to ingest data to a period from SQL servers. Okay. We don't have an outbound SQL connector at the moment. For that, we use um, modern web APIs. Got it. So if you need to get historical data into a period, ODBC will work. Uh, if you need to get historic data out of Canary, ODBC will work as well. All right, we are, we've got to be the are end you gonna, the Are you seriously going to just pass over Keith's question? Keith, yes, I am. Keith, get out of here. Wonder if you guys can go through setting up security to do MQTT server. Yes. See, Alan, afterwards, he's going to gladly now. Is there a, does somebody want to take that? Sorry, Keith. Yeah, th that's a pretty quick answer, particularly with the case of HiveMQ. Because HiveMQ is a cloud application, they have signed their servers with global CAs, certificate authorities. Uh, and that makes it really simple because when the Epic, in this case, connects to the broker, uh, it already has that global CA in its own trust store. So there is no security setup relative to TLS certificates to connect to the broker. Uh, that makes things really simple. On on-premise brokers, uh, you will ha you know, have to put a certificate in, have it signed, and make sure you have the client certificate in the Epic. And that's easy enough to do. I went very quickly through that security setting where I can put in client certificates. But generally, it's pretty straightforward. All right. Thank you, Benson. Sorry, Keith. I didn't mean to give you too hard of a time. Uh, um, and Garrett, I'm going to suggest that, um, Garrett, I want to get you connected with the period because I think you all need to have uh, a conversation and some next steps. You've got some great questions. I want them to be able to get with you. Um, easiest way for someone to get a hold of a period is it use uh, Greg's email? Yep. Okay, yep. so we've got Greg. Um, I'm dropping Greg's email. I already have. It's in the chat for everyone. Did um, you pop it in again? Yeah, I think it went to only host and panelist. Oh, it did. Um, yep, yeah, and I just did the wrong one. So, sorry. Let's see here. Um, one second. Let's see if we can get it to everybody this time. There we go. All right. So if you've got questions for Aperio as we end, please email Greg. That's greg at aperio.ai. You can probably figure out how to email Peter and Ron following that same format. Um, you can reach out to Sean S. Ebersole at canarylabs.com. Uh, Benson Kudzai, what's the easiest way for folks to follow you or to ask you questions? So uh, for Opta22, um, probably the quickest way to get answers is we have a live chat on our website, um, all manned by engineers, not by chatbots. Uh, so that's a quick way to get started. Um, otherwise, uh, filling the contact us form on our website will work. I see all of those. And if there's anything specific to this workshop, I'm happy to uh, respond. Otherwise, BensonH at Opto22.com. Okay. And Kudzai, same thing, online, easiest? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, the easiest to uh, reach out to me is uh, through uh, LinkedIn at Kudzai and Teresa. And uh, if you need to fill out the contact form, also we do have that on the HiveMQ website. So you could uh, just go there and drop your message. Okay, thank you, Kudzai. Yeah, website. I, I don't know why I don't have access to to chat with everyone, but the Aperio website is aperio.ai. So, thank you, Alan. Um, and with that, I think we are coming to a close. Let's talk about what to expect next time. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not. Kyle, someone wants to run a proof of concept and they're like, you know what? I don't want to spend time working through connectivity. I'd like to just get Kyle to do it for me. Well, uh, how do we engage with you, Kyle? And how can Avidine help run some POCs? Yeah, um, you can do it in a multitude of ways. Uh, if you just go to avidine.com, um, we have our you know, host of services as well as our 
um, as well as our actual um, software products. Uh, we have WellTrack, GraySwift, uh, Lattice, which kind of handle their own things, which is you know tracking wells, doing uh, water tracking and uh, general messaging and task management. Um, and if you're looking for pro services, we do have an email, um, which is just uh, on our website for support at avidine.com. And my email is kp. Uh, Muldoon at avidine.com. And I, you can look me up on LinkedIn as well. If you want to add me as a, as a, as a connect, as a connection, all that good stuff. Um, just look up Kyle Muldoon and you'll find me there. And all of those are, are, I'm more than happy to directly talk to you about any of any of our services or if you need any help. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's do some closing thoughts uh, to each of the panelists. Thank you so much. Um, it was a big, it was a big task today. Uh, if we think about what has actually been accomplished, um, some live machine learning data from the edge up to the cloud and 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 back. Um, I can't thank you enough, Alan, for the amount of time you put in with each of the panelists to get this ready for today. Thank you, sir. Are you ready for a nap? You got it. <laughs> All right. Well, Alan said he's ready for a nap. So that means this virtual workshop is in the books uh, to our community. Thank you so much for showing up. You always do in such a big way. And we look forward to talking to you during the week in a great live.com. All right. With that, thank you. And we're out.